Good morning. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin and will also be up on the screen. I invite you to follow along with the bold print. The Lord be with you. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will be glad and exult in you. Let's do just that and singing praise by singing the hymn, Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet. Let's come to God in a word of prayer. Lord God, we come before you this morning giving thanks for who you are. Thank you that you have made this world for us to live in, that it bears witness to to your greatness and to your beauty. As we observe your wonder in creation, may we remember that it is in your action toward us that the truest expression of love and beauty is to be seen. You have made the first move in Jesus Christ, and you invite us into a life with you that is full of abundance. You supply all we need and more, and you are worthy of all the adoration and praise that we could ever give. Thank you for being our God and calling us to being your people. Through the power of your Spirit at work within us, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Our prayer of confession is also printed in the bulletin. I invite you to follow along as we read together. God of everlasting love, we confess that we have been unfaithful to our promises to you and to one another. We have worshipped other gods, money, power, greed, and convenience. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you and your people. We have not loved our neighbor as you commanded, 
nor have we rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of your promises to you and one another. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Hear this good news. It's because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. He has saved us through the outpouring of his grace, his generous and indescribable grace. Let us believe this good news that in Christ God has forgiven us and poured out his grace on us. We are made alive in Jesus to live a new life in this grace. Amen. Oh, hi. I got some Play-Doh here. I got lots of Play-Doh here. I like having lots of Play-Doh. It's a good thing. See how much Play-Doh I've got? Do you think I have enough? Maybe I have enough to share. I don't know. Do you think I have enough to share? Oops. You ready to catch? We often don't think we have enough of something. Many things. But it really is surprising that we often have more than enough. Much more than enough. And we are invited to share the enough, the more than enough that all of us have. Freely given to us that we might freely share. Let's pray. God of grace, you give us more than enough. Abundantly blessing us. Help us to share. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm speaking on behalf of the stewardship team, a group recently formed by session to look at what stewardship means at St. Andrews and communicate some timely and important information. Simply put, stewardship at St. Andrews is all about our ability to live our church's mission, to accept Jesus Christ's love, embrace Jesus' teaching, and share with those near and far. Stewardship commonly includes a focus on three critical areas of church life. Time, making time for the many areas of outreach, mission, and a myriad of other church activities. Talent, using your God-given gifts to glorify him. And treasure, giving back what we can or tithing to support the work of the church. This morning, I'd like to focus on treasure and specifically how a large part of all our givings is put to use at St. Andrews by highlighting some of the many projects we've taken on in or around the church building. Did you know that we've completed some significant repair and maintenance projects on our church building, totaling approximately $74,000 over the last two years or so? We've repointed a large part of the building masonry we paved the parking area on Tower Street. We repainted all the external windows. We replaced the soundboard and projector. We upgraded and enhanced the fire alarm system. We recently replaced much worn carpeting in the office area. All of these project expenses are planned for within our annual budget and represent examples of ongoing maintenance 
work necessary to maintain a building of our size and age. In addition, we have non-discretionary expenses like hydro, heating, water, insurance, and other necessary for basic property upkeep. In 2023, our budget for the planned maintenance projects and the non-discretionary amounts will total approximately $64,000 and make up more than 13% of our annual church operating budget. Financially here at St. Andrews, over the recent years, we have fared very well, especially during COVID restrictions. However, for 2023, we anticipate an operating budget deficit of approximately $50,000. Our 2024 budget is now being prepared and will likely rise as expenses continue to climb. We ask that you prayerfully consider increasing your contribution relative to this expected increase. I'd like to summarize with a word about consistency. Consistent giving means we won't have to borrow money mid-year and hope for a strong December to balance things out. You may wish to consider PAR or regular givings at the beginning of each month, whatever works best for you. We know that committing to any amount on a consistent basis takes trust in God and confidence in the use of the money being provided. We hope this message was received in the positive way in which it is intended and look forward to continued discussions about how St. Andrews can live out our mission statement. Accept Jesus Christ's love embrace Jesus' teaching, and share with those near and far. Thank you.
from the one who saved my life. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. Jesus, my name, I believe. All praise to God, our Father. All praise. Let us pray. God of grace, take these words that we are about to read, that we might hear your voice speaking. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 6. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must as you have made up must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way in your great generosity which produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of the ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has shown you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Here ends our scripture for this morning. I want to connect where we have been in talking about Paul to this text because they actually go together. So on Paul's third expedition through Turkey and Greece, he had another hat that he was wearing, another task that he had taken on because there was a particular crisis and challenge throughout the Roman Empire that was particularly deep in Israel, Palestine, Judea because there was a food shortage, a famine through much of the Roman Empire, but particularly, as I've said, in Judea, Palestine, Israel. And he is raising money to support the Christian community back in Jerusalem and Judea, 
who are at the heart of the famine area, but who themselves are under persecution, economic persecution, and therefore are in particular need of financial support. And so Paul is at pains to make this clear that he is coming to Corinth and will collect what they have given and will take it to Jerusalem. But he has a bit of a, that's a bit of an understatement, he has a bit of a complicated relationship with the church in Corinth. And therefore, he spends two chapters, eight and nine of 2 Corinthians, making his case for this offering and why it should take place. And we are picking up the end of those, that two-chapter argument that he lays out. And so this is very much part of his mission work. He sees this as part of what he is doing in nurturing and discipling followers of Jesus Christ. So what does he do? He begins with a proverb that you're all going to say, well, of course. But isn't that the case with most proverbs? We all say, well, of course. And the proverb is this. Those who sow sparingly will have a small harvest. And those who sow generously have a big harvest. And we say, well, yeah, right? If I only sow a little carrots, I'll only get a few carrots. And if I sow lots of carrot seeds, I'll hopefully get lots of carrots. But he's saying something deeper than that. He's driving at the question of stewardship, of giving, of generosity. And he unpacks this in this way, that if we are generous in our giving, there will be an abundant harvest. Now let's be clear about what Paul is not saying. Paul is not saying, if I'm really generous, God will fill my bank account. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. If we are generous, there will be an abundant harvest of righteousness and praise to God. That our joining with God generously, abundantly, in what God is doing in the world will produce praise and glory to God. Because at the heart of the human experience, at the heart of what it means to be a human being, is this truth that we've learned in the first question, the Shorter Catechism, right? We all know this well. For Presbyterians, I'm smiling. What's the chief end of human beings? The chief end of human beings is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. That our highest calling is to join the glory and praise of God. And in our generosity, that happens. So practically, what does that look like? Well, some of that praise and some of that generosity is very concrete. So think about the gifts we give to hearts. Yes, sometimes the schools from Haiti write to us and say thank you. But we know deeper than that and more real than that and more profound than that is that they give thanks to God that our generosity allows for them to have enough. When we from the Benevolent Fund here help people in our own community, I often hear from them, thanks be to God. The praise going the right place. But it's not just in concrete terms that that happens. It happens in other ways too. That care and compassion, that ministry reaches out to people, touching their need where they are. Think about grief share. An opportunity that people have and hear a comfort and a compassion and a care for them flows out in words from them, thanks be to God. same way that we see our ministry as church preaching the good news so that people hear that and they themselves say thanks be to God. The sports camp who touches families' lives and parents say thank you for being here. Again and again and again, our actions of generosity lead to praise and glory, a rich harvest of that. As I've said, Paul has a complicated relationship with the church in Corinth. 
And so he knows some of what they're thinking. And so he takes that on. He knows that some of them are thinking, yeah, right. You want me to be generous to other people so that I don't have enough. You want me to be generous so that it actually becomes painful. Paul's really clear. We have enough. We have enough. Now, I realize and I recognize that there are moments in our lives when we're not so sure that we have enough. We've known those stressors. They're part of what it is to be a human being. But again and again in those moments, they are followed by signs of God's grace and generosity. My last term in theological college, about five weeks before the end of term, I was not sure I had enough money to make it through to the end of term. In fact, I was pretty sure I didn't have enough. And I was pretty stressed. Well, I got a phone call from the principal's office. Now, I was 26, but I still have to admit that a phone call from the principal's office to show up was a little intimidating. So, I went. And he pulled out an envelope and handed it to me and said, this is an anonymous gift. It's for $200 which was just more than I had calculated as to be what I needed to get through to the end of term. I had enough. I had enough. In our lives, there have been those moments. Those moments when we didn't think it was there, and something happened, and there was enough. I mean, the fact that we're here proves that, right? There was enough. Does that mean I learned well what happened to me when I was 26? No, I still sometimes fret and worry. But the promise is this. God will provide enough. Paul also says that giving this way takes planning, takes forethought. There's something in our culture that has told us that the really good gift, the truly generous gift, is one that comes from the heart in the moment, and we just write a big check for the moment, and we all feel good, and it's wonderful. And we may not do that for another while. In fact, in giving, the tortoise beats the hare every time. consistent pattern of giving over the long haul gives more, is more generous than the episodic big blowout. Now, a consistent pattern of giving, planned and thought through, is in fact the truly generous way to give. I'll be forever grateful to my parents who from the first time I got an allowance taught me to tithe, to give 10%. Now, in, Iran, in, in, in Beirut, in Lebanon, that was fairly easy because my allowance was one Lebanese pound. And so 10% of that was 10 piastres. And so I was given my pound in a way that made it possible for me to give 10 piastres every Sunday. When we came back to Canada, one Lebanese pound worked out to 30 cents Canadian. So that meant that on Saturday I got a quarter and five pennies. So that three could go in the offering plate in Sunday school. Three of my pennies. I had friends whose parents slipped them a dime or a quarter as they dashed off to Sunday school after children's time. And I had three copper coins. But again, I am forever grateful to my parents who taught me the reality of tithing. 
out of what I had, out of, what I'd been, out of my income. Yes, it takes planning. Yes, it takes forethought. But it is a habit that keeps on giving to our lives, enriching our lives, making them deeper. The third thing that Paul wants us to understand and uses as an argument in his, making his case with the Corinthian church is this. That our discipleship, that our following of Jesus, one of the ways that is seen is in our generosity. That the way we give is a sign of our commitment to Jesus. Yes, our discipleship is about more than just money. Our discipleship is much larger than that. But our discipleship is never about less than money. Money is on the table as we think about how we give, how we live this life of following Jesus. How we treat our money is a sign of whether we are deeply committed to following Jesus Christ who has given his life for us. One of the commentators I read this week commented that one of the most profound signs of God's working in a person's life is when the tight-fisted meanness is replaced by open-handed generosity. That is a work of the Holy Spirit in us as we join God in what God's generous reality is. That we become participants with this God of generosity and grace, joining Him in what He is doing. But I want to end with a story. It's a longer story, so you can sit back and relax. I didn't make it up. It comes from a book entitled, Stories Bob Benson Used to Tell. Do you remember when, you had old, when they had old-fashioned Sunday school picnics? I do. As I recall, it was back in the olden days, as my kids would say, back before they had air conditioning. They said, we'll all meet at Sycamore Lodge in Shelby Park at 4.30 on Saturday. You bring your supper and we'll furnish the iced tea. But if you were like me, you came home at the last minute, and when you got ready to pack your picnic, all you could find in the refrigerator was one dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the bottom of the jar that you got it all over your knuckles trying to get it out and just two slices of stale bread to go with it. So you made your bologna sandwich and wrapped it in an old brown bag and went to the picnic. When it came time to eat, you sat at the end of a table and spread out your sandwich. But the folks who sat next to you brought a feast. The lady was a good cook, and she'd worked hard all day to get ready for the picnic. And she had fried chicken and baked beans and potato salad and homemade rolls and sliced tomatoes and pickles and olives and celery and two big homemade chocolate pies to top it off. And what they had spread that out next to you, and that's what they spread out next to you, while well, you sat with your bologna sandwich. And they said to you, why don't we just put it all together? No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even think of that, you murmured in embarrassment with one eye on the chicken. Oh, come on. There's plenty of chicken and plenty of pie and plenty of everything, and we just love bologna sandwiches. Let's just put it all together. So you did. And there you sat, eating like a king, when you came like a pauper. One day it dawned on me that God had been saying just that sort of thing to me. Why don't you take what you have and what you are, and I will take what I have and what I am, and we'll share it together. I began to see that when I put what I had and was and am and hope to be with what he is, I'd stumbled on the bargain of a lifetime. I get to thinking sometimes, thinking of me sharing with God, 
When I think of how little I bring and how much He brings and invites me to share, I know that I should be shouting to the housetops, but I'm so filled with awe and wonder that I can hardly speak. I know that I don't have enough love or faith or grace or mercy or wisdom, but He does. He has all those things in abundance and says, let's just put it all together. Consecration, denial, sacrifice, commitment, and crosses were all kind of hard words to me until I saw them in the light of sharing. It isn't just a case of me kicking in what I have because God is the biggest kid in the neighborhood and he wants it all for himself. No. He is saying, everything that I possess is available to you. Everything that I am and can be to a person, I will be to you. When I think about it like that, it really amuses me to see somebody running along through life, hanging on to their dumb bag with that stale bologna sandwich in it, saying, God's not going to get my sandwich. No siree, this is mine. Did you ever see anybody like that? So needy, just about half starved to death, yet hanging on for dear life? No, it's not that God needs your sandwich. The fact is, you need his chicken. Well, go ahead. Eat your bologna sandwich as long as you can. But when you can't stand its tastelessness or drabness any longer, when you get so tired of running your own life by yourself and doing it your own way and figuring out all the th answers with no one to help, when trying to accumulate, hold, grasp, and keep everything together in your own strength gets to be too big a load, when you begin to realize that by yourself you're never going to be able to fulfill your dreams, I hope you'll remember that it doesn't have to be that way. You've been invited to something better, you know. You've been invited to participate with God. We've been invited to take what we have and join it with what God has, to participate with Him in what God is doing in the universe. That's called stewardship. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord, you are the great and good God who has blessed us. We are astounded at the abundance you have poured into our lives. The abundance, and we say thank you for it, the abundance that allows us to have enough that we might share. Shape us into people who join you and your patterns of generosity in this world, taking the more than enough that we have to share so that others may have enough. We say thank you. Use what we give to, that your name and your glory might be revealed throughout the world, that praise might rise to you, you who are King of kings and Lord of lords. We do thank you that you are at work in our world. We rejoice that some of the hostages have been released, that there presently is a pause in the fighting. We pray that somehow this would evolve into peace. We pray the same for Ukraine, that there would be a pause, that there would be a moment where the fighting would stop and people might think about building towards peace. We pray for those who are sick. We remember those who grieve. We remember those who are overwhelmed by life, those who fear that no one cares for them. We hold all of these before you, that you might be the God of grace to show care and compassion. We also become rejoicing rejoicing in the good gifts you pour into our lives and the opportunity you give to us to share with others. In this silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. We pray all of these things. In the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's some announcements to bring to our attention. It's good to celebrate God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we gather together in worship. Thank you to everyone who was involved with the craft and craft show and the bake sale yesterday. They raised $3,300 for hearts. So thank you for everyone who was involved with that. Um, the other announcements are there for your perusal. Just a couple I want to highlight. You'll see an announcement there about library. Please have a look at that and notice the details there. Um, and I also want to note the details of Advent coming up. There's an Advent Bible study that will begin on the Tuesdays, so the three Tuesdays of Advent. Um, there will also be Advent devotion material that is being put together, and then our worship services for Advent. Um, I hope you'll take that and mark that section. Let's give to God, who has been so gracious and generous to us. Our tithes and offerings will now be received.
Let us pray. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you. Use them that all the world might know of your love and grace and bring praise and glory to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in singing now, Thank We All Our God. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, because now and forevermore. Amen.